Baka. With a knife? No, it sounds crazy, but it looks like they were killed with a giant pair of scissors. The giant scissors, once again, search for prey. A trail of terror stretches across Europe, from Norway to England. Here it is, the Barrow's Mansion. We have to go there and look around, or we'll never solve the mystery of scissor nets. Got to be joking. It's way too dangerous. As long as he's alive, we're not safe anywhere, guys. One after another, <gasps> the horrifying murders continue. <gasps> we'll make it through this game of murder alive. <laughs> Clock Tower. There's a story I've told many times over the years that seems to grant people a lot of joy. When I was about 11 or 12, I borrowed the neighborhood copy of Clock Tower on the PlayStation 1. Many of us had played it, and it just kind of was handed around and then sat with that person until someone else wanted to borrow it. I had watched the game many times and enjoyed it over the years, so this had gone on. But I finally wanted to borrow it myself and popped it into my PlayStation one day. Now, I made sure it was midday with lots of sunshine popping through the windows when I played it, and the game was scary to smaller Aaron. I played the prologue to the game knowing full well what was coming. Scissor Man hijinks were ahead of me after the admittedly very dull prologue that determines the rest of the game. So it goes. I finish the prologue and start Helen's section of the game, again knowing full well what's going to happen, as I had seen the game many times. However, the dread begins building in my chest because, as I said, this game scared the hell out of wee lad Aaron. That's me. Scissorman, as he do, busts into the nap room, chases Helen out. I hide, he goes away. Now, I'd watched the game many times, as I said, but I'm someone who doesn't really retain much of the game unless I'm the one playing it. So I had no recollection of where to go or what to do, but I was sure of one thing. That Scissorman was coming and he would try to kill Helen. The music slowly crept back up, and he reappeared on screen. I had no idea where to go or what to do, despite having seen the game, as I said, numerous times. So I shut the game off. I had the game for days, and didn't play it out of sheer sense of dread for it. One night, I managed to have a dream about Scissor Man that scared the living daylights out of me, and the next day, all I could hear in my head was the Scissor Man chase theme. In my child head, the game being in the house terrified me because it somehow meant that I would have to play it eventually. So, in a panic, I took the disc in my hand, snapped it in half, and threw it away. My wife garners no end of amusement from this story, as she always tells me how cute it is. I suppose. However, I think that the child me knew something about this game, and by extension the previous game on the Super Famicom. See, I was never afraid of the Resident Evil games. Ever. I love the Resident Evil games to bits, especially the fixed camera games on the PlayStation. But I never had any fear of these games from watching or playing them other than I wasn't very good and I never made any progress. I never had Resident Evil nightmares, never had any issues watching people play them, and never had any of the music stuck in my head unless it was because it was a certified banger. <laughs> Clock Tower always struck me to my core, I think, because it really was just about survival. The best you could do was run and occasionally fling something at Scissor Man to make him go away for a little bit. But 
but there was no clearing out rooms of zombies to make it safe, and no power of your own to even the playing field. If Scissor Man caught you, you could punch him or kick him in the balls, but this would only delay him, and would only work if you had enough health left for your character. That, good people, is horror. A sense of futility in the situation that is surrounding you, and perhaps a feeling that you're never really safe walking the halls, since Scissor Man could come back at any moment. I very much love this game, and, in fact, would likely place it as one of my favorite games ever. A wild sentiment, according to many, I'm sure. I will say that the game is not without its flaws, as the puzzles can be frustrating, the presence of, to quote Genghis Kate on YouTube, fuck you items, where you can't get the best ending without them, which are found in the first scenario, slash are common items, uh, for which you would not know to look for, and some obtuse logic to get things done that can cause a lot of irritation if you don't know exactly what to do and where to go. All right, so we're gonna grab uh, we're gonna grab an oil can here, which is uh, the fuck you item. Uh, yes. Gotta grab this item here in the very first scenario, or you can't get the perfect ending, Fun and time. you can't go back to the first scenario. So. And I, I hate that. The game is certainly a product of its time, and while it has a lot of ambition, it doesn't fully realize that ambition due to the graphical limitations, but also from what I sometimes perceive as a lack of focus. See, the game has a lot of great ideas, but many of them are only half realized. You have two playable characters, but they don't intersect in any way. You have a lot of backstory from the previous game, but it's not really used to much of any extent. You have a lot of potential for psychological angles, but because it's a video game, there's not a lot of time to explore those angles. There are two novels for this game that were released in Japan that add a lot to the lore and the experience. But there's a problem. They were never officially translated into English. We do have a fan translation of Helen's novel, which I've linked in the description below. But no translation exists for the Jennifer novel, which, one would think, might be more important, as Jennifer is the main thread running through both games. That all being said, I still love this game to death, and in fact, am always on the hunt for people streaming it for the first time, while trying my very damnedest to not spoil anything, or interfere without being prompted for help. Thing is, I think I see this game for all of its potential, and past all of its flaws. I still love the Scissor Man chase themes, and get dread when I play the game. Perhaps not to the disc-snapping levels, as I do own a physical copy of the game, but knowing he could pop out of any corner while I'm walking around, or could just, you know, appear through a door while the chase music slowly ramps up, really hits me hard when I'm playing. One thing about this game that is very evident is Hifumi Kono's flair for the dramatic. Human Entertainment was not initially interested in making a sequel to the original Clock Tower on the Super Famicom. However, when they saw the opportunity to develop for the PlayStation, Kono thought this would be the best option because of the capability of the hardware. As a result, we get numerous dramatic camera angles and some pretty well-handled cinematography because of the ability of the PlayStation to be able to set the camera where Kono wanted it for certain shots. This results in some very dramatic snippets seen throughout the game, such as the fax machine, Scissor Man cartoons, the kill computers. the main hall entrance, and of course one of my favorites, the door to nowhere. Many of the game devs from this era show their proclivity for being cinematic, and with the capability of the PlayStation, Kono was able to let this facet of himself show through, much to fans' delight. 
That's not to say these scenes aren't goofy in a lot of ways, but I think the campiness of these moments really lends themselves well to the older slasher movie sensibilities that a character like Scissorman would possess. Before I break down the campaigns, I wanted to speak about the characters in this game. There are definitely some highs and some lows here, considering that some characters don't even have any spoken dialogue for the entirety of the game. We of course have the two protagonists, Helen and Jennifer, whose scenarios we undertake in the game. They both bring strengths and weaknesses to the table, and have their ups and downs in their respective scenarios, with highlights in each of them for the game. Then, we have one of the biggest pricks I have ever seen in a game from this long ago, Professor Samuel Barton. His tunnel vision for his goals may only be bested by one Chief Brian Irons from Resident Evil 2. The 1998 version of Resident Evil 2. He seems to have just a big stiffy for his research and profiling and has one of the most misplaced priority statements I have ever heard when he says, You may be her guardian, but you are also assistant really dude next we have harris and nolan the two <laughs> romantic ish interests for jennifer however for me it's akin to this weird one-way keyboard carrot as harris likes jennifer and jennifer likes nolan but i don't think anything is really reciprocated by anyone else frankly but we'll get back to harris and nolan shortly we then have edward who is said to be a survivor of the Clock Tower murders, but really plays little role in the adventure on the whole until the endings of the game, along with his guardian, Kay, who similarly plays little role in the game other than specific endings. We have Inspector... It's Assistant Inspector. Yes, yes, whatever. It's Assistant Inspector. Okay, fine. Assistant Inspector Gotts, who really shines in this game with what little character he has going for him, but he can really make the most of it. Lastly, we have the cavalcade of side and background characters that go thusly. Rose, Beth, Danny, Baker, Mr. Sullivan, Rick, Rick's dog, and everyone's favorite, Tim the Cameraman. None of these characters make any real difference at all other than being motivation fodder at best and at worst, in Danny's case, does absolutely nothing at all. Poor Tim, though. His death doesn't even count against you in the final scenario for either character. Those, my good viewers, are all of the characters of even the slightest import in this game. Oh, can't forget Hitler's security guard, but he gets what's coming to him. Hmm, some kind of weirdo? <laughs> One last thing I want to address is the weird, as I said above, love keyboard carrot amongst Jennifer Nolan and Harris. Harris is a weird creeper. There's no doubt about it, since Jennifer at the time of this game is a mere 15 years old, and in Norway, the age of consent is 16, according to some swift Googling. Full stop, Harris is a creeper, and he gets what's coming to him. Nolan and Jennifer are more of an interesting duo to examine. I've spoken at decent length with my wife about this, and I don't think that Nolan really has much interest in Jennifer from a romantic perspective. I believe that all indications point to him having a slightly more pragmatic or even pure want to protect Jennifer. People get hung up on the fact that he consents to what he calls an interview and a date, but I simply perceive this as him trying to get the story since he is, in fact, a newspaper reporter trying to get a scoop. Is this the purest of motives? Absolutely not. But it isn't the first and won't be the last time someone pulled some strings to get a story. However, I would say by the last scenario, Nolan takes an almost big brother position. He is worried about Jennifer pretty consistently and wants to find her in Helen's game. And in Jennifer's game, he is ready to fist fight Scissorman to allow her to escape. The kiss in Jennifer's A ending is pretty one-sided. Does he resist? No. However, he isn't the one to initiate it, and he may or may not have been too injured and tired from being buried in a collapsed castle to resist. If it makes anyone feel better, developer Hifumi Kono also doubts Jennifer's relationship with Nolan will last long, and that's if 
Nolan was ever interested in the first place, which, as I said, I doubt. Helen's campaign really steals the show for better or worse, as it is the only one of the two campaigns in the game that actually allows you to play as Helen in all three scenarios. You play as Helen at the university, can play as Helen traipsing around the Metropolitan Library, and finally, as Helen wandering around the old Barrows castle. Note, I did say Barrows, not Burrows, not Barrows, Barrows for everyone out there. However, one of my favorite scenarios is also in Helen's half of the game, which is Gotts, visiting the old Barrows butler Rick's house. Stan Gotts does not fuck around, as his first instinct is to unload his revolver into Scissor Man, but to no avail. He has his mission of retrieving the statue that Professor Barton sent there and find the location of the Barrow's castle. It's a small house, and Scissor Man could be anywhere around any corner, even watching cartoons in a TV room or popping out of the same damn floor panel you just checked. To be fair, you can also play this scenario in Jennifer's half of the game with Nolan, but Gotts really makes this scenario his own, I think. This scenario is also where Scissorman's true horror is fortified, yet strangely trivialized in a manner of about 30 seconds. You see him take an entire cylinder of revolver ammo to the face, only to get up and chase you. But then, if you run into a certain hallway and pick up an umbrella, you can slam Scissorman over the head with it, and the chase is over. This is one of the aspects of the game that really seems to have people at a loss. Scissorman, as I said, can take an entire revolver's worth of bullets like a damn champ, but can be handled by an umbrella, a bedsheet, a ladder, a punch to the face, a kick to the balls, a pot on his head, or a spray can of mace as just a few examples. He is simultaneously the most persistent and endless stalker I can think of in video games besides Nemesis, while at the same time he can be dispatched with common household items or a fist. I think this contributes pretty heavily to the somewhat lessened view of Scissor Man and by extension, the game clock tower itself. I think this is really a shame as the game has good wackiness but knows when to turn up the fear and is always reminding you that your predator is never too far behind. Jennifer's campaign is by no means a slouch. The creator, Hifumi Kono, when speaking of the importance of each campaign, said, quote, For me, the Jennifer path is the real story, but to understand Professor Barton's story, the Helen path is important too. So to me, it's really looking at multiple sides of a larger story. End quote. So while Helen's side is an important part of the story, Jennifer is the real star of the story, which is aided by the fact that she is in both games and seems to be tied to the Barrows family as a result. Which is why it pains me to say that Jennifer's campaign is, in fact, inferior to Helen's in nearly every way. There are reasons for that, of course. She is only a 15-year-old girl, and she has less agency in her own story, as she seems to just let things come to her versus Helen, who is an older woman in her 30s who goes to the situation to meet it. Jennifer cannot be the playable character in all three scenarios for some reason, as in the second scenario we either send Nolan to Rick's house or play as Helen in the library. This still makes sense because she's a 15-year-old witness to serial murders of her friends and finding her dead father's skeleton in a murder mansion, so I can see why she might be more vulnerable and the other characters will want to tackle these situations for her. Scenario 3 of Jennifer's campaign is by far the most irritating scenario in the game because one of the main items, the door spell, has to be found in the first section of the scenario, as I unfortunately rediscovered during a recent playthrough, or you're stuck with a bad ending. Also, if you don't completely make a beeline for certain rooms in the absolutely correct order, random characters will just be dead. And yeah, you're pretty boned. The biggest, however, for this scenario is that you don't know the deeper meaning of just who the culprit is unless you're playing Jennifer's campaign. If you get the A ending for Helen, you find out who it really is but don't get the deeper meaning, which is a real shame. 
The music in this game, while pretty minimal, is pretty atmospheric in my opinion. There are three different chase themes that are played during the scenarios. We have the regular chase theme, the reprise chase theme, which is my personal favorite, and the weird version of the reprise with some weird moaning noises in it that I find, frankly, inexplicable. There is, of course, ambient music. Or feature music when something happens or needs to have your attention drawn. The absolute banger, of course, is the ending theme entitled Darkness, which I listen to frequently these days because it is a very awesome techno-ish remix of the theme song. Overall, I would say that the music does its job, especially in the sense that it sets the tone with its chase music and has a nice classical and understated theme that really has a creepy old horror movie vibe. I think when all is said and done, Clock Tower on the PlayStation 1 is what I would call something of a hidden gem. It's not a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination, but it has a lot of potential that, unfortunately, is more delved into with side material like the novels. If you can acquire a copy, I would give it a try. Emulation is always an option, but I've noticed some weird audio bugs when people emulate these games. However, the price of a PlayStation 1 copy of Clock Tower isn't so cheap as it once was when I bought my copy off of Amazon in 2007 for about $20 or $25. So perhaps emulation may be the recommended method. What I do know is, if I'm alone in the house, and it's very quiet, the Scissorman chase theme may just start creeping up on me.